Socialists are very intellectually dishonest in the argument of privatisation they try to paint everything down to a question of two things, whether it's nationalisation or of course the privatisation. They completely ignore the difference between true private ownership and what you call fake private ownership, in other words private name only. A strongly government regulated private sector isn't really truly private. The government still heavily involved, still strongly controls it through all the heavy government regulation etc. And they want you to believe believe that somehow it's all the one thing. Another thing that they completely ignore in that argument is the difference between the companies that would take on government subsidies to that of those who refused. Those who refused who were the market entrepreneurs would end up giving the political entrepreneurs a showing up. In other words, the political entrepreneurs who took on the government subsidies, they would all face bankruptcy. America built an entire national highway system. So there you have it, under Abraham Lincoln you would face the nationalisation as well of course using internal improvements, which is basically the corporate subsidies. The income tax didn't come around until 1913 and it's important to make the distinction Abraham Lincoln's presidency with that of the turnpike industry and contrast that to what was before then. Now before Abraham Lincoln's presidency all the internal improvements were basically vetoed. In the first industrial revolution between 1794 to 1845, the private turnpike industry was running very successfully. The private road building movement built new roads at rates previously unheard of in America. Over 11 million dollars was invested in turnpikes in New York, some 6.5 million dollars in New England and over 4.5 million dollars in Pennsylvania. Between 1794 and 1840, 238 private New England turnpike companies built and operated about 3,750 miles of road. New York led all other states in turnpike mileage with over 4,000 as of 1821. Pennsylvania was second, reaching a peak of about 2,400 miles in 1832. New Jersey companies operated 500 miles by 1821. Between 1810 and 1845, over 400 private turnpikes were chartered and built. What you've got to remember in the first industrial revolution, you've got to ask yourself the question, what was 11 million dollars actually worth? And then if you look at 1911 where it cost $65,000 in damages to pay for the ash building for the Triangle Shutways factory fire. If $65,000 in 1911 was an absolute bomb, what the hell do you think $11 million was worth in the first industrial revolution? If $5,000 a year was considered rich for a politician in those days. What the hell do you think 11 million dollars is worth? Now remember before Abraham Lincoln all the internal improvements were vetoed. So in other words the market was financing the turnpike industry itself. Roads were built, completed successfully. The roads met the demands of the consumer. Hundreds of competitions, the roads were kept in good condition etc. Now contrast that to what happened under government through that of the internal improvements under Abraham Lincoln. Roads left unfinished. Roads built to meet government's own self-interest. In other words, they would build roads right through people's own private farmland without their consent. And eventually they faced bankruptcy, which is just classic of that of the government subsidies. And one of the strongest supporters of the internal improvements Ohio was actually the first state to legislate against the internal improvements after the bankruptcy happened. So that shows you the failure of government's intervention with the internal improvements etc. Many other states in the south as well even you know followed Ohio's footsteps with legislating it against in their own legislation against that of the internal improvements. And he doesn't even touch upon all the government run roads that you see today that are filled with potholes. Along with the largest and best public colleges and universities in the world, also public schools. Again, what he doesn't actually tell you is the state education, etc. Where the main influence stems from is the Prussian school model. Before the state education, etc., the free market education was actually providing a high literacy rate. From the state education, main purpose, where it stemmed from, was used for political indoctrination and that's exactly what you've been seeing and it's the very reason why you're seeing so many that have been dumbed down to believe that somehow socialism is the answer to their problems. And national parks, majestic bridges, dams that generated electricity for entire regions, public libraries, public research. But around 1980, 
the moneyed interests began pushing to privatize much of this, giving it over to for-profit corporations. He doesn't touch upon what the privatisation means. Is it a case that it's a strongly regulated private sector or has the government strongly deregulated? Well, I've pointed out so many times before, you can see there for yourself, it's private in name only. Privatisation, the argument went, would boost efficiency and reduce taxes. The reality has been that privatization too often only boosts corporate bottom lines. For example, consider Trump's proposal for infrastructure. The problem is that it depends on private developers who'd make money off of both tax subsidies and private tolls. And there you have it, folk. There's the government subsidies. And you see the corporate subsidies, etc. and the problem you're seeing in today's economy. Again, like I mentioned, there's a strong difference between a private sector left be to regulate itself with the market entrepreneurship that refused to take on the government subsidies to that of private companies today that end up taking on government subsidies and it faces so much failure. Again, the corporate subsidies, etc. that's never going to make private ownership work. You don't have a free market. Again, he's trying to paint it as if to say, well, here's the private sector you've got the day. Well, privatisation must be a failure, therefore you must bring in nationalisation. It's an erroneous argument. So the public would get charged twice without any guarantee that the resulting roads, bridges or rapid transportation systems would be built where they're most needed. Now, it's true that private for-profit corporations can do certain tasks very efficiently, and some privatisation has worked. But the goal of corporations is to maximize profits for shareholders, not to serve the public interest. The question should be, what's best for the public? So many of these people don't have a clue what profits are. And you always see this term for profits. Now, like I've mentioned before, investors, etc., they're only going to invest where there are profits. If you were an investor, why the hell would you want to take the risk of an investment and basically invest in an area where it's loss making? Because you would be making a loss yourself. If you work hard and you make then an investment in something and it's making losses, there's no incentive for you to even do that. But in order for you to invest in an area where there is profits being made that means it's an area where there are consumers buying so that is basically the area where the consumers interests are it's the consumers who drive what the profits are profits is information conveyed to the market, driven by consumers' demand. Profits is the information of consumers' needs and wants. Again, it's one of these things that the investor's only going to invest in an area where it is profitable, in other words, where the consumer is in demand of. So it's not placing for profits above, you know, consumer demand over and above public interest. It doesn't even make rational sense. Number one, don't privatise when the purpose of the service is to bring us together, reinforcing our communities, helping us connect with one another across class and race, linking up Americans who'd otherwise be isolated or marginalized. This is why we have a public postal service that serves everyone, even small rural communities where for-profit private carriers often won't go. All it's doing is forcing people together through coercion to pay for such services, even if they disagree with it. And there are many people who disagree with the public services and belief in the privatisation. The other thing is the US Postal Service is inefficient. Just like, you know, typical of public services, it's run inefficiently. There's an issue where it's outdated, etc. And it needs privatisation. You can find actual articles on this topic issue, and I can even provide one below that you can go and read for yourself. You just pay it as if, well, at the end of the day, you can just run things without profit. And when you talk about privatisation, they then use the argument to say, well, look how this isn't working. Well, no wonder you won't let the free market be. You're overregulated the private sector. What the hell do you expect? Number two, don't privatise when the service is less costly when paid for through tax revenues than through prices set by for-profit corporations. America's hugely expensive for-profit health insurance system, for example, is designed to sign up healthy people and avoid sick people, while running up huge tabs for advertising and marketing 
and giving big rewards to shareholders and executives. It's going down the road of this healthcare system you see today that's corporatist. It's very much anti-capitalist. It's in the absence of the free market. They introduced insurance for absolutely everything, even for all the unnecessary things. They ended up pushing the cost through the roof, all the licensing issues, etc., forcing doctors to up their costs. This is the very reason why the healthcare system today is just so extortionate. It's got absolutely nothing at all to do with the fact, oh, look, there's 49% private sector, a private sector that's basically over-regulated by the state. Which is why the administrative costs of Medicare are a tiny fraction of the cost of for-profit medical insurance. This is rubbish, folk, and it's basically like someone saying that the NHS is more affordable because it's free at the point of use. But that's looking at things for face value. It's not looking at the actual wider cost in the background, like that of the broken window fallacy. But you've got to ask the question, where's the money coming for to pay for all of those so-called free things and available, etc, etc? Well, it comes for other people. So the cost of living drives up elsewhere in the economy. You face all the other problems elsewhere in the economy, such as cutbacks, etc., all in the name of paying for the so-called Medicare, so it comes at a greater cost elsewhere in the economy. That expensive insurance issue that you're seeing, you can't ignore scarcity in the laws of supply and demand. What the hell do you expect when demand is soaring out of control? Made it mandatory to have such health insurance for absolutely bloody well everything? Of course, in a supply and demand issue, you're going to create a, a soaring cost issue through the direct primary care model, when they removed 80% of the health insurance, what that basically means is, is it frees up the health insurance for that of people who have more serious issues. Therefore, they can bring the cost down of the healthcare. And socialists, for the life of them, really don't understand the first thing to do with scarcity. They think scarcity is just something that you can just magically wish away. Number three. Don't privatize when the people who are supposed to get the service have no power to complain when services are poor. This is why for-profit prison corporations have proven again and again to violate the constitutional rights of prisoners. And why for-profit detention centers for refugee children at the border pose such grave risks. There's many Americans that would be able to touch upon that argument themselves. This is a government problem. This is not a thought today with the fault of the private sector. And again, the private sectors are regulated. So what are those rights that they've apparently violated? When you talk about for-profits, one of these things that he doesn't understand what that means. Again, it's one of those things he try to paint the privatization argument in black and white. Number four, don't privatize when those who are getting the service have no way to know they're receiving poor quality. The marketers of for-profit colleges, for example, have every incentive to exploit young people and their parents because the value of the degrees they are offering can't easily be known. A big reason for why you're facing the education costs that you've got today is because of all the government subsidies, etc. that's pushing the cost through the roof. All of that's really the fault of government's intervention in the market. What he's basically doing, and it's important to note this, when he tries to paint things down to a question of nationalisation or an over-regulated private sector. Well, where's the argument of the free market? He just pretends it doesn't even exist. You don't have the free market competition. Number five, finally, don't privatise where for-profit corporations face insufficient competition to keep prices under control. Giant for-profit defence contractors with power over how contracts are awarded generate notorious cost overruns because they're accountable mainly to their shareholders, not to the public. Shareholders, investors really only invest where the interests of the public are where the profits are. And the only way they're going to make profits in the first place is by consumers' demand. And there is a bit of a concession there. He's saying don't privatise when there isn't the competition. Well, the solution then isn't public ownership. The solution is to basically open up the free market, bring in the competition, and then it'll bring down the costs. <laughs> That's quite a concession, that. So that basically he's just defeated his own argument of the public ownership. But yeah, if you've got anything you would like to add in, you know, comment in the comment section below. Be sure to like the video and share the video, and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you for watching, I shall talk to you later. Cheers.